Tamar Sharon is a researcher and she researches how digitalization destabilizes public values and how best to protect them. She's professor of philosophy, digitalization and society at the Radboud University, co-director of the interdisciplinary hub for digitalization and society and a member of the European group on ethics at the European Commission. In her talk, she argues that the European health data space will give big tech companies easy access to European health data. This raises significant risks, which are not being taken into consideration by current legislation. A very warm welcome to Tamar Sharon, who will join us live. Okay, hello. Uh, hi, thank you, Tobias. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation also to speak. You summarized the talk very well, <laughs> but now I'll try to give that some flesh. Um, uh, I'm sorry for any technical, okay, here are the slides now. All right, good. So I will jump right into it. Um, in her uh, State of the European Union Address of September 2020, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen addressed the union hard hit by the COVID-19 pandemic. And she appealed to the value of solidarity, which is one I know that's being discussed a lot these two days. She appealed to the value of solidarity as key to resilience in the face of the crisis. The pandemic, she stated, had underlined the need for even closer cooperation in health among the member states. With this aim in mind, she stated, a strong European health union would be built and a new chapter in the European project looking to the future was um, opened. Now, the backbone of this European Health Union would be the European Health Data Space. Uh, this is what I'll be focusing on today. And I know there has been quite some discussion about this already. The European Health Data Space, which should be the first in a series of sectoral data spaces, including public administration, finance, agriculture, energy, and others. The aims of this European health data space, we'll call it EHDS from right now, which is currently in the proposal stage, are twofold, uh, relating first to healthcare and second to research. So first of all, the EHDS seeks to enable citizens to share health data with hospitals and practitioners across member states with the goal of improving healthcare delivery across the union. And secondly, to create a robust legal framework for the reuse of health data, so for research but also innovation, policy making, and regulatory activities. It's the second aim that I'll be focusing on in my talk. Now, since the um, opening of the first consultation round for this proposal, uh, there have been many commentaries, critical commentaries, looking at what are the challenges and some of the concerns raised by the proposal for this regulation. Um, some of which I assume that have been also mentioned uh, yesterday. I'm sorry, I couldn't participate in the talks yesterday. But these tend to be uh, about things, um, including things like privacy and data protection, how will informed consent be organized in the data space, harmonization with existing regulation, uh, such as the GDPR, um, but also enforcement. So there's been quite a lot of critical discussion around this proposal already. I want to raise here uh, a different concern. And that's that the current proposal will, as Tobias mentioned, enable easy access to big tech companies to this treasure trove of European health data. And that this raises risks that are well beyond what the authors of the EHDS proposal seem to consider. So let's look at this in some more detail. The EHDS, as mentioned, aims to facilitate reuse and sharing of data by various actors. That means not only researchers, but also industry. Um, indeed, promoting innovation that will improve prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases is really one of the stated objectives of the EHDS. Um, and this uh, involves data uh, that would be relevant in this respect, data from um, the healthcare system, such as disease registries and electronic health records, but also health impact data, such as social and behavioral data, and data generated by individuals through the use of apps and wearables. Now, until recently, 
um, industry actors involved in biomedical innovation tended to be limited to the pharmaceutical industry. But recently, this group of industry actors has begun to include large technology corporations. Since um, at least 2014, virtually all major tech corporations, Alphabet, Apple, IBM, Amazon, Facebook, recently rebranded Meta, but also Palantir, Huawei, all major tech corporations have moved quite aggressively into the area of health and medicine. This is a uh, phenomenon that I've been studying with a group of researchers with funding from the European Research Council at Radboud University in the Netherlands for quite some years. We've called it in some papers, the Googleization of health. So the push of these tech corporations into health and, and biomedical research. In this time, so I've been looking at this since about 2014, these companies have been um, hiring medical experts and building in-house health tech departments. They've begun collaborating with world-renowned research institutions and university hospitals, mostly in the United States, but not only. They have been developing um, all kinds of health-related applications from apps for mobile health to AI for disease risk prediction to health record management, but also things like moving into health insurance, and even I would say health provision with some virtual care services. Uh, but also I think I have up here, yeah, Google, Google Verily, uh, Google's Verily um, opioid treatment center. So this is a brick and mortar clinic for opioid addiction uh, that they helped build uh, a couple of years ago in Ohio in the United States. So they've been moving into health in a very diverse uh, uh, set of ways. And so, as you can imagine, access to large amounts of high quality European health data uh, for these companies is really a kind of wet dream, I would say, or a dream come true. Um, there are several good indications of this, of say the enthusiasm on the part of tech companies for what's happening with the regulation, uh, the proposal for the regulation for the European health data space. Um, so going through the first public consultation that the commission opened for the EHDS, we found really enthusiastic comments, for example, by Microsoft and Huawei that were left there. This is, um, so this is from the first round of consultation. And actually, it may even be surprising that only these two tech giants left comments. Um, but that's probably because many other tech representatives have been busy with substantive lobbying efforts targeting key provisions during discussions, <clears throat> excuse me, on the proposal. I wasn't present myself at these discussions, but I have heard this uh, firsthand from somebody who was. And the proposal itself um, gives the example of how the EHDS regulation should facilitate access and safe use of health data to do things like train diagnostic algorithms and automated decision-making systems, which we know is really um, um, the purview of, of, of these large tech companies. So this is taken from the Q&A that the European Commission offers about the European health data space. Now, the... EHDS certainly is, is not intended to be a kind of free-for-all run on European health data. It's precisely about proper regulation of access to this data, which will require a permit from so-called health data access bodies when this is set up. And when it comes to big tech and the apprehensions that we might have about big tech's relationship to the EHDS, the regulation puts in place what uh, I think we can see as two important general criteria that these health data access bodies will need to look at if companies um, request access to the data. Uh, and these are in general, I think you can say, we can call them data protection, but also societal interest. So let's look at these uh, a little bit closer. First, with regards to data protection. So privacy and security are seen as key in the regulation. Um, citizens should be confident that their health data is adequately protected. This is something the previous speaker was really pointing out as well. Uh, the proposal claims to be designed in full compliance with the general data protection regulation. 
Now, there is quite some discussion going on currently as to how exactly the EHDS will sit alongside the GDPR, namely when it comes to individual consent for secondary use of data. I am not a legal expert, um, so I won't go into those details, but my point is that privacy and security of data are seen as crucial elements here in, in the European health data space. So companies should only be granted access to the space if the requested data is used for specific purposes, in closed, secure environments, and for data that is anonymized or at least pseudonymized. This is specified, I think, in Article 44 of the regulation. So data protection plays an important role here. The second important criteria uh, for access to the space is what we might call societal value or societal interest. Uh, recital 41 of the proposed regulation states that access to data for secondary use should contribute to the general interest of society. Of course, societal interest is a very vague concept that the proposal actually does not uh, do much to clarify. But the regulation does specify a list of purposes for which access to this data are prohibited. That helps out a little bit here. Uh, and this is relevant in the case of companies. And I would say certainly in the case of big tech, knowing what we know about many tech companies and, and how they handle data. Uh, these prohibitions include uh, purposes such as making data available to third parties, uh, using data for commercial advertising, using data for insurance purposes, or using data to develop products that can harm individuals and society at large. So some of the examples that are given there are for developing uh, drugs, illicit drugs, tobacco, or alcohol. So data access bodies should always consider access requests against these two central criteria, data protection and societal interest, which again, I think are quite relevant when it comes to big tech companies who have a reputation of questionable data handling practices, uh, especially in relation to things like privacy, targeted advertising and profiling and sharing of data with third parties. So, this, I think, is uh, it's quite commendable, let's say, for, on the part of uh, the, the regulation. However, and nevertheless, from the research we're doing in my project on the involvement of big tech in health and medicine, we have no reason to believe that these two criteria would actually present much of a difficulty for tech actors interested in accessing the EHDS and its treasure trove of high quality data. Why not? Well, <clears throat> privacy and security are very important concerns when we're thinking about big tech's recent push into health and medical research. Um, over the past few years, we've seen a number of developments where tech companies haven't handled access to patient data in secure and privacy preserving ways. So we can think here of the controversy between Google's DeepMind, it's an AI offshoot, and the NHS in the UK over a data partnership, which allowed DeepMind to access identifiable health data on 1.6 million patients without their explicit consent. This was in 2016. Um, a few years ago, Google came under scrutiny again in a partnership with Ascension, that's the second largest health system in the United States, which granted the company access to over 50 million medical records. And more recently this year, Meta has been accused of accessing medical data on millions of people via its uh, MetaPixel data tracking tool, which was installed on dozens of hospital websites in the US. And so the regulation should be very careful here when it comes to privacy and data protection. I'm not saying at all that it shouldn't, but many of the initiatives that tech companies are busy developing and implementing in the medical sector, which we're studying in my project, don't require using data in ways that are privacy unfriendly. Um, some of these initiatives don't require the use of data at all, which means that a focus on privacy might be, or a, 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 a sole focus on privacy might be somewhat displaced. So the example I put here is Apple's ResearchKit software. Um, this is software that Apple launched in 2014, 
uh, which basically allows clinicians to run studies on iPhones using the iPhone to collect health data. Um, for the most part, this data that's collected on the phones does not go to Apple. It's sent to repositories where researchers can then access it for doing research. So Apple, as was claimed at the launch of this uh, software, doesn't really see this data. Um, actually, Apple doesn't need to see this data for it to be, for the software to be successful. I'll come back to that in a minute. But the point is that there is no real privacy issue here. Even more worrisome, I think we can say that privacy currently is being instrumentalized in a way that actually allows these companies to move more easily into the health sector. A good example of this is the API for digital contact tracing that Google and Apple developed in the early days of the pandemic. This API complied with all of the stringent privacy and data protection criteria that had been identified by privacy experts as essential for privacy preserving digital contact tracing. The most important uh, of these being that the data would remain on phones so that the apps would be decentralized rather than data being collected and sent to a centralized storage system. Ironically, uh, in this uh, uh, situation, Apple and Google were actually portrayed as greater privacy champions than some democratic governments, such as France, France, which had been developing and insisted on holding on to a centralized app. Centralized apps were portrayed as being privacy unfriendly, again, because the storage uh, uh, of the data would be in a centralized um, system. Um, what happened here is that when it was clear that the privacy risk uh, was accounted for in this API that Google and Apple were offering, most countries across Europe and in many parts of the world agreed to work with it. Yeah, Some of them even went back, like Germany, to uh, redesign an app that would be decentralized so that they could work with this API. And this is often what we see in collaborations between big tech and public research institutions in the health domain in my project, we see that privacy and data protection are immediately seen as a big risk when these actors are present or involved. And so privacy preserving infrastructures are developed to mitigate this risk if that's certain legal stipulations, if it's ethical guidelines, or if it's actually uh, privacy by design technologies. And once this is dealt with, everybody's happy and we can go forward collaborating with these companies. So there's quite a narrow focus on privacy and data protection here. So my point is that in terms of this first criteria for data access to the EHDS, uh, based on the current research that we've done, a focus on privacy and data protection will not substantially hinder big tech from accessing um, the space. Now, importantly, and this gets us to the, the second criteria, societal interest, I think there's an important reason as to why big tech, at least in the health domain, have become so much more privacy conscientious than they were uh, up to a few years ago. Of course, they have reputations to uphold, and they may also believe that privacy is a fundamental right, which needs protection. We shouldn't be too cynical. But I think the most important reason here is that the business models driving big tech's expansion into health are not primarily about hoarding personal data and selling it to third parties. This is a business model which we know well, all too well, from search and social media, but it's not what is happening necessarily in the health domain. So if you take the Apple Research Kit, which I mentioned earlier, this software will be successful when it and the iPhone as hardware become essential components for carrying out remote clinical trials, which is increasingly being upheld as the future of clinical studies. Again, Apple doesn't need to see, handle, mishandle, analyze, do anything with data in order for that to happen, in order for this to be a success. If you look at the different uh, prohibitions stipulated in Article 35 of the regulation that I mentioned earlier as to um, prohibiting access to data, these are mostly about doing these creepy things with data that we do know that big tech has been involved in, profiling, targeted advertisement, 
but that again, we've become specifically aware of from social media and search. These are indeed what we might call antisocial uses of health data, which contradict the principle of societal interest. But that's not what these companies, I believe, seek to do in the health and medical sector. Many of the initiatives that we're studying in our project are partnerships between big tech and research institutions for what we could call genuine societal interest. They're involved in research on Parkinson's disease, on heart disease, on eye disease, on mental health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, it's not always clear how these initiatives will be monetized. Uh, I put up a quote here from Mustafa Suleiman, who at the time of the NHS uh, DeepMind controversy was the head of AI at DeepMind, speaking here about their involvement with the NHS. And he says, right now it's about building the tools and systems that are useful. And once users are engaged with them, we can figure out how to monetize them. So it's not always clear how initiatives in the health and medical domain will be monetized. Um, but I think it's quite clear that using personal health data in ways prohibited by the regulation don't constitute the main way of monetizing this involvement. So if big tech can relatively easily comply with these access criteria, uh, privacy and data protection and societal uh, interest, you may ask, what's the problem? right? Maybe big tech are getting their act together. They're doing good things. What is the big fuss here? Is there anything to worry about if big tech is both handling personal data in safe ways and is using this data for societal interest? Well, I think there are problems that remain. These are risks that we've identified in our research project and that I think that the European Commission should be much more attentive to in its overall general data strategy, not even only in the EHDS. Um, let me run through these uh, a bit quickly. Um, I've named three of them here. The first risk is what I would call equitable returns. So not only data has monetary value, while these comp companies may not be trading in data, again, the business model we know from search and social media, they are using health data to develop algorithms, which are proprietary. So what we have here is public data from hospitals and research institutes being used to develop proprietary algorithms in a model which the economist Mariana Mazzucato has called paying twice. The public sector pays once for the generation of these data sets, which, is used, uh, which uses public financing, and a second time for buying back algorithms and services developed using that data. As far as I see, nothing in the regulation attends to this issue. Another risk that I think we should be careful of here is um, that the more these companies get involved in medical research, the greater role they will begin to play in setting research agendas. And the question is, do we want such powerful commercial actors, non-European commercial actors, to have a say in research agendas? In a democratic society, the setting of research agendas should be a result of some form of public deliberation. A third risk I think we need to be very careful of is that big tech's expansion into health and medicine really needs to be recognized for what it is. And I would say that that's the development of critical digital infrastructure, including clouds and analytic services for medical data, electronic health record management, software for remote clinical studies and monitoring, and diagnostic algorithms. This is all critical digital infrastructure, which will be indispensable for digital health and medicine in the future. So they're building the computational infrastructures on which the sector of health and medicine may well run in the future. Now, importantly, health and medicine is not the only sector into which big tech is expanding. This is happening simultaneously, really in all sectors that undergo some form of digitalization or datafication, including education, transportation, public administration, agriculture, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 
any of these sectors that undergoes digitalization, we're seeing that these companies are very quick to move in and to offer services and products. And so I think that we may gradually see a creation of new dependencies on these actors, really for the running of critical sectors and for the provision of public goods, public goods like health and education and public services. This is to say, and with this I conclude, um, that the focus on data protection and even societal interest in the proposed regulation of the EHDS are not enough when we're dealing with big tech at the barricades, as I call it, of our European data spaces. We need to broaden the scope of the trade-off here. We need to start including thinking about what we lose gradually, eventually, and on a larger societal scale when we facilitate, it, when we facilitate access of big tech to this treasure trove of um, data. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Tamar. Um, shalom. Um, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Vanad Berlin. I've I've reading your research and I've um, listened now to your um, excellent keynote and I share a lot of your concerns. Although I not only focus on big tech, I focus on business models and data capitalization, and it's quite. Um, looking at your presentation um, and looking at um, the statement of Ursula von der Leyen about the health union and everything that I've been reading, when I read the proposal of the health, European health data space, there is a lot of mention of privacy, which is described as a fundamental right in Article 8, but there is no mention at all from Article 35, which is our fundamental right to health care. There is zero text in there about another fundamental right. And that makes me suspicious, because when you also hear Ursula von der Leyen, it's about creating a transatlantic market. Uh, it's creating health industrial opportunities. And we know these negotiations, because there have been trade agreements between the European Union and the USA. And when you then look at the US, um, not only from a market perspective, but a fundamental rights perspective, it's one of the only um, 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 high-income countries who doesn't <laughs> give their citizens the right to access to healthcare. Mm -hmm. And you have been doing research on your transgressions of fears, and which is a shift from norms and principles um, from one sphere to the other. And I think the European, if you can call it the sphere of healthcare, is a very different one as the sphere of healthcare in the USA. So the cost of healthcare in the US have gone up from 16 GDP percent points um, 15 years ago to 20 percent. Life expectancy has been dropping down since seven years and the top one percent is 15 years longer as the poorest people in that country. It's a very different way of handling care. So I share your concerns if we mix these things together and we take care about the societal interest, which is a very vague definition, I ask myself the question, why do they not focus so much on Article 35 as much as we focus on privacy? Mm. Do you uh, share that concern? I do. I agree with um, everything you've said. You said many things. Um, I'm not sure if that's the kernel of the problem. Uh, but I think, so I would say several things. I think completely this kind of hypersensitivity that we've developed as a society, but as a legislating union as well to privacy and data protection has very good, has, has, is there for good reasons. I mean, we've have a, a history where we've learned that privacy is really at stake and it needs protection, but it's doing damage by now, I think. So there's this over-focus on privacy at the expense of other values and maybe other fundamental rights like health. Uh, and we should be very careful to see that, you know, when we're, as I said, when, once we've dealt with the privacy issues, that doesn't mean the discussion is over. That's only, it's really only the tip of the iceberg uh, in, in a phenomenon like big tech expanding into new societal sectors. 
if we were to focus more on the right to health, that could help, I think. So one of the things I'm looking at in my research is if we use this uh, framework of sphere transgressions and understand that big tech is transgressing into these societal spheres. And as it does that, it brings certain value sets and a certain way of doing things and certain types of expertise, which could change spheres. We may need to focus more on protecting spheres, maybe even less, let's say, of a focus on data subjects and more on these societal spheres. And there, the fundamental right to health would be very important. And I think it could be really helpful. I have another question, though, and I pointed at this a little bit in my presentation right now of, you know, well, big tech, they can be helpful to help us improve healthcare and medical research. I think that there's a lot of value that they could bring to the table. And then you're left with the question is with the question of, well, what if big tech does help us uh, improve health? of populations, of individuals, improve medical research. Is there still something wrong? I think there is. And I think that that's why thinking of society as this kind of aggregation of different spheres, which have their own norms and say fundamental rights and values, which need to be balanced out is important because we might have greater health in the healthcare sphere, but if it's a private company that's now providing us these basic goods and that we're becoming dependent on, and that this is happening across all sectors of society simultaneously, we're in a very different position. So I don't think we should also only focus on the fundamental right to health either, but we should focus, I think, on what Lynette Taylor has called the publicness of a sector, so that a sector which is about providing basic goods like health or like education or public services needs to remain autonomous from private actors to some extent. It's not to say that collaboration can't be had, but we as a society need to keep the upper hand here. And I think that that's not properly being looked at. So a lot of the collaborations we're looking into between big tech and public research institutions, these types of questions, these types of broader societal values are not brought into play. It's mostly about is patient safety properly dealt with, is informed consent properly dealt with, and and you know, and then we're done. Then it's okay to collaborate with big tech. Sorry, that's Thank a very you. long answer, that's, but it was a <laughs> No, I, I had a very long question, so that's <laughs> fine. It's a very complex uh, and big topic. Um but let's stay with big um like uh, we talk about big data and you just mentioned that um uh, perhaps these big tech companies can really help us with um, solving issues in healthcare. Now, I've been focusing on the AI space, which is sort of the engine that dives in the data and learns and gives us new insights that could help us to solve um, questions around diseases. Um, and mostly it were these big tech companies that were able to handle these large or had access to large amounts of data, had the infrastructure, to train large language models, for example. Um, and it has been criticized, the large language model AI train that took off a few years ago with GPT-3 has been largely um, criticized by a lot of academics because it was a monopoly as well. It was driven by a company called OpenAI, which, which got a, a billion on funding from Microsoft. And um, it was an it had nothing to do with open uh, because the only thing that was open was the the name of the company and the API itself that you could access. But everything else was opaque. Now, a year ago there was some a, a coalition or a group or whatever you call it called Big Science, uh, alignment of incentives between scientists. That and there were thousand scientists in Big Science collaborating to train a large language model where they had uh, been working with local communities, um, have been working on open source standards, and they launched in August this year uh, a model called Bloom, which is better in performance, much more, um, 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 less, uses less much energy, so it's way more efficient as GPT-3, and has been published as open source. Mm -hmm. And it showed that when we align incentives between scientists 
and 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 they, they published a paper with thousand authors, which is the, the the biggest paper I've seen in the number of authors. But it showed, and when we collaborate in the open, that we can compete with our infrastructure, our mm -hmm. research infrastructure that we have, and it gave me hope that when we align and when we unite and when we focus on a on a shared vision and purpose that we can compete we don't need big tech or open ai to do this the french government gave that team access to access to jay-z which is their uh, supercomputer which is the third most powerful supercomputer in the world um, mm -hmm. so they they got infrastructure like the french government paid the fifth five million on euros needed to train that model. So do we have a, a, should we not focus as well on within the research infrastructure to kind of change the alignment of the incentives? Because the incentivization of research is, is not made for large collaborations. It's yeah. made for individual recommendations or citations or whatever mm -hmm. you would call it. Is, yeah. is there not something we should do more on a, on a policy level to, to kind of push for more collaboration. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. Um, so I didn't know this example. It's, it's quite interesting. And I think I'm I maybe... You, I can send you yeah, stuff. Do, uh, please. <laughs> I don't know if I'm as hopeful as you, but these types of examples certainly are hopeful. So because the, the, the story we tend to tell ourselves, and I mean, it's an empirical question if this is accurate or not, but the story we tend to tell ourselves is that we in the public sector and we in Europe cannot compete with the types of developments that we see taking place in the private sector and certainly in, in large American corporations. Um, the more we tell ourselves that story, the more it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And I think we really should be spending a lot more investment and energy and understanding in how important it is that we would in Europe and in the public sector develop our own infrastructure for doing these kinds of things. Uh, what you're saying is that in order for that to happen, there also needs to be a change of incentives within the scientific um, domain towards more collaboration. Uh, that I would have to probably, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a general claim that you're probably not wrong. Uh, what we could do there specifically, I'm not sure, but I think this has to be part of a larger data strategy, right? Which the European Commission anyway is busy thinking about and implementing and legislating about. So these types of things of how can we um, promote and support more of this type of work that could counter what we're seeing coming from big tech and from pri the private sector in general needs to be thought through better. And yes, if that has to go through more incentives for scientists to collaborate, uh, and, and publications that have a thousand scientists on them counting for something, because often they don't count much for junior scientists, then that's one way of doing that also, yeah. Yeah, I, I also wonder why you focus on big tech and not on uh, big med tech and uh, bit big pharma, because mm -hmm. the, the, the data acquisitions in the uh, tech scene, like we creating startups that have exactly the same model as big tech. I think I, I have more problem with the with the model of data capitalization or seeing data as something that equals capital or um, is measured as a capital value. Uh, mm -hmm. But we have examples like there was a an Austrian startup, My Sugar, who collected um, data from one million diabetic patients. There was a startup uh, in, in the U.S. Uh, flat iron that um, was collecting two million oncology records. It was a bit like WhatsApp. Hey, doctors, you can use your electronic record for free. And yeah. then they were all entering the data. And then four years later, they sold it for 2.1 billion, both my sugar and flat iron to Roche. Yeah. So these things are happening. Roche is, a, is, is for me also a, yeah. a, 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 an organization that kind of acquires data by acquiring companies mm -hmm. and 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 so there is no difference for me between a big tech and rush because they are following the same business model mm -hmm. and it leads them to the information asymmetries that actually give these companies the advantage so what i would like to ask is like we have been discussing yesterday the data commons and i believe that we need to push for open sourced ai standards which destroys somehow the 
model or the business model from big tech or the opaqueness from these uh, algorithms, as you mentioned, which could lead to more um, in inequity in, in, in the system, because I think open source is a sort of, it would level down um, uh, the ownership of knowledge and it would kind of create a common layer of, of, of knowledge that all companies can use. So we have been discussing how we can create something what we call data solidarity. Um, so we, we license data that we give consent for with um, what we call in the tech industry um, a copyleft license. That means that if you use that data, all the data processors need to um, um, use or um, apply that license and all the extractions they get out of that data. Um, that means that um, if you create an AI model or train an AI model on that data, the AI model needs to also be licensed under that same license. And that means that the AI model needs to be open. So yeah. that means if you want to touch that data, I don't see you anymore. I don't know why, but I hope you're still there. Uh, but if, um, yeah, there you are. Um, um, so can we not hack it by by creating more protection in Europe, like going further as the European health data space and say like, we need the principle of solidarity. We need article 35. We, we create something that is more to do with sharing and, mm -hmm. and, and not ownership of, of these uh, artifacts mm -hmm. that yeah. um, make a digital solution. Yeah. Yeah. I have a lot to say here because you raised many points. I'll try kind of quickly. So, my own interest in big tech was the the now I don't see you anymore either. It's terrible to be speaking to yourself. If I could get yes, far back, no, thank you. Yes, yes, <laughs> uh, my own interest in big tech. There's a bit of a history to how the research uh, project developed, but I think there's something quite different between say big pharma and big tech here. I mean, big pharma have always been doing this commodification, commercialization in the health domain. We know what we're dealing with in a sense. Big tech was something new. And I don't think that it's exactly the same norms and values and expertise that they bring in from the world of the data economy that now maybe Roche has understood how to play that game, but that's not originally their own set of values. And what's been interesting to me is to see that this isn't just happening in the health sector. The same companies keep jumping kind of piggybacking into any sector that undergoes some digital digitalization. So it's a bigger threat in that sense, if you're looking at the actors and how they differ. The question you're saying is, is it a different threat to the sector itself? That you might be right. It's There's similar things happening. And my project tends to focus on big tech, but that's also a question of how many people we have and how much research we can do. There are many smaller tech companies where which are doing things in health and education where big tech is on the back end and so you don't even see big tech but they're also there so that all of these different levels should be indeed looked at um when it comes to open source i'm not really a specialist in the whole open source discussions i do get a sense though that there's a new focus on open source as there was on privacy and we should be careful of thinking that if everything is open source we've solved the problem because as far as i see these companies are also now in many initiatives using open source and so it's not only about being opaque again if we understand their push into sec new sectors like health as an attempt to build the computational infrastructure on which everything can run that can be open source and still be problematic. So I'm, I, I, again, I'm, I'm not that familiar with the open source debate, but I think we should be careful of seeing it as a new panacea. Um, when it comes to data solidarity, yes, I think that what I called the problem of equitable returns is exactly about that. So we as a public have created value. We're kind of handing it over for free. It's a very bad deal. There's not a proper discussion of what gets, comes back. Now, interestingly, I didn't speak about this in my presentation, but if you look at the EHDS, I mean, von der Leyen has often mobilized the value of solidarity. Uh, it's an important European one, and that's good. Um, you have a bit of a shift in the EHDS. There is no talk of solidarity. There's this new concept of data altruism, which I have to say kind of freaks me out because at least with solidarity, and I'm thinking here of the excellent work of uh, Barbara Preinzak, solidarity is reciprocal, right? You, you, you kind of carry a cost with someone you see a, similar, a similarity, but that's also in a sense expecting that to be returned at some point. And this is what our healthcare system is also based on. Altruism does not have that reciprocity. And the, 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 uh, 
the type of consent that the EHDS regulation or proposal is discussing right now is the one that's taken from the Data Governance Act, which is data altruism, which is a way of getting around the problem of broad consent in the GDPR. But if you think about it as a value, it's very much a one directional thing of just giving. And so we might be even in an even worse situation, I would say. I think there's a lot of work to be done here. I have a postdoc, a philosopher, trying to work on this a little bit of do we, you know, do we have a shift here actually from data solidarity to data altruism, which will be even more, which will have even larger negative impacts, I think. So the whole question of um, reciprocity of equitable returns of what, what what conditions are in place for proper equal collaboration with these companies doesn't play much of a role if data altruism is what's organizing everything. I, I think, Tamara, I have to uh, visit you in Rabaut because I could talk hours <laughs> with you. And I think there's a lot you can learn. I was 20 years in big tech software. That's my background. Um, so I have quite some insights that I can share. And I think there are solutions uh, even within the framework, within the data trust for altruism. But it's, I think the solution is about data licensing uh, mm. and putting the rules in the licenses itself. But mm. unfortunately, the time today is limited. Uh, and I want to thank you so much for um, joining us um, today here. And it was a really, really insightful lecture, keynote and conversation. And I'm looking yeah. so much forward. Uh, to further conversations because what we started today with this summit is a dialogue and we're going to continue this dialogue with Barbara Prinzak as you mentioned in January and, and February later. So we're going to do this on a two weekly basis because the only way to um, find a solution is to really understand the problem. And I don't think we really understood the problem really well uh, because it's so complex and so vast. So I hope you join us further in that dialogue next year and uh, wish you a great Christmas time or holiday season. And uh, thank you so much for joining. Thank you so yeah. much. Tamar. Thank you for having me. It was really interesting. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye.